Satan's pulpit. The four hidden dynasties are political, economical, educational, and religion. I can't help but believe that religion is probably Satan's favorite tool to use. I mean, while the religious pulpit is supposedly where people go to hear the word of God, oftentimes it becomes a tool to accomplish Satan's will rather than God's will. And when that unfortunately happens, that pulpit has become Satan's pulpit. When you hear a man or a woman of the cloth say, you don't need to understand the book of Revelation or any other part of God's word for that matter. You're listening, you're hearing Satan's pulpit. Another prime example of something you would hear from Satan's pulpit is Easter. When what is supposed to be the highest Sabbath of the entire year, and our Passover, of course, is Jesus Christ. But what's supposed to be the highest Sabbath of the year, Satan's pulpit has tens of millions of Christians out rolling Easter eggs in the groves. I'm sure Satan is gleefully laughing at them. I'm also sure that our Heavenly Father doesn't find one bit of humor in it. The false doctrine of the rapture and the traditions of men that make void the Word of God are also tools of Satan's pulpit. Let's begin our study in Nehemiah chapter 8 today. And we're going to begin with what should be heard from the pulpit, from religious pulpits. Let's pick it up and asking that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears as we begin Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads, And, or then, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street. That's probably better translated in open space or area. That was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. Note the people asked Ezra, bring the law. And you know what? For many of them, they had just come out of Babylon, out of captivity. So this would be the first time many of them are hearing the word of God. Perhaps they were beginning to realize that there was a wall that was more important than the wall they had just rebuilt around Jerusalem. That wall, of course, our Heavenly Father, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Well, where did he command that? Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 11 through 13. God states there, when you gather together, in the place that I will choose in the promised land, that's Jerusalem, of course, and gather all the men, the women, and the children, the foreigner that lives among you, and read in their ears the law, that they may learn the law, and that they might revere me, the Lord speaking. And you see, when Satan's pulpit takes over, that's the problem. You don't hear the Word of God. The Word of God that, that tells you how to be pleasing to Him. You go with Satan's pulpit, you're going to end up in captivity to someone, probably the Antichrist in this generation. Verse 2, And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that would hear, that could hear with understanding, all the children that were old enough to hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. The first day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, the Hebrew word for the month, or the seventh month, is Tishri. The first day of Tishri is the Feast of Trumps. It's a very uh, sacred month. You had the first, the Feast of Trumps, the tenth, the Day of Atonement, the fifteenth, the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, and then even a holy convocation, a Sabbath that followed the Feast of Tabernacles. But the duty of the priest was to read 
the law to the people. You see, at this time, people weren't that educated. Not, all, not everyone was able to read. So the priests, their duty uh, was to read the word. And not many today are being taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Verse 3. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, from sun up till noon, before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. No Easter eggs, uh, no traditions of men. The word of God straight up. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah and Shema and Aniah and Uriah and Hilkiah and Maaseah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Malchiah and Hashum and Hashbadana, Zechariah and Meshulam. You don't hear any Kenite names in there. You don't hear any Nethanim names in there. In Ezra chapter 2, verse 48, we had one fellow named Nakoda. He was a Nethanim. And he was trying to claim that he was of the tribe of Levi rather than a Nethanim. These are all Levitical names. You have 14 priests there, if you count Ezra included. 14 in biblical numerics is salvation and deliverance. The Word of God brings salvation and deliverance. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book, better, the scroll, in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up in reverence to the Lord and to the Lord's word. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen. That means that is truth, that is truth, and stated twice for emphasis and great solemnity. With lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They humbled themselves before the Lord and worshiped Him, as we do today. Also Yeshua and Bani and Sherebiah, Jamin, uh, Akub, uh, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maaseah, Kilata, uh, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place, instructing the people in the law. That was their work, and they're doing it well. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. Check out this word distinctly. It's parash in the Hebrew tongue. It means separate and divided. When I read that, I couldn't help but think about 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where it states, Study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Very important to understand God's word that you rightly divide it. And gave the sense, this is sekel in the Hebrew, it means intelligence, and caused them to understand the reading. There's a whole lot of difference between hearing something and understanding something. We get letters, hundreds of letters a week from people who say, you know, from the time I was a child, I knew that there was more to God's Word than what I was being taught. And I wanted to understand God's Word, but I'd try and read it myself, and I'd get frustrated, and I couldn't understand but then I found some teachers who could teach God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Now I understand, and the Word brings joy. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, this Tershatha is a, a Persian origin, uh, and it means governor. Uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer for Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. But he asked him for permission to lead a group back to Jerusalem, and that's where Nehemiah is now. But he's the governor appointed by Artaxerxes, the king of Persia. And Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, 
for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Many of them probably weeping for different reasons. Uh, some of the older congregation who were born in Judea before the captivity and now have returned, it's been a long time since they've heard the word of God read. Many of the youngers, as I said earlier, probably the first time that they had heard the word of God. I'm sure many of them were probably weeping because as they heard the word of God, they realized they weren't doing the word of God. Verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat or the surplus, you know, the fat belongs to God, and drink the sweet and send portions unto them whom nothing is prepared. The peace offerings, part of that would have been a sacrificial meal to be enjoyed by the people. And this is what this is saying is those who are poor and don't have anything to offer for the sacrificial meal to send portions to them. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This word strength is defense or refuge. I want you to remember that, that verse. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It's our, our refuge, our defense. That wall that they built around Jerusalem was a defense. Not anything like the defense that the wall that God can build around his children. But when the ways of the world start getting you down and you read the newspaper and you read the ungodly decisions being made by uh, people who are in positions of judgment in the United States and you get overwhelmed by it. You get discouraged by it. Remember this verse. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Verse 11. So the Levites stilled or hushed all the people saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy, neither be ye grieved. Stop your crying and, and belly aching. This is a joyous day. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth or joy, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. Again, there's a big difference between hearing something and understanding it. And they were joyful because they understood what Ezra and the other priests were, were teaching them. That brings joy. Understanding the word of God brings joy. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priest and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. They wanted further understanding. One day of instruction wasn't enough. They were hungry, just as many today are hungry, beloved. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, on the fifteenth day of Tishri, the Feast of Tabernacles. Booths in the Hebrew tongue, Sukkuth. And it literally means booths. Uh, Sukkuth also was the first place that Israel encamped when they came out of Egypt. Uh, the first place of encampment was called Sukkuth. And that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees to make booths, as is, is, is written. Verse 16, so the people went forth and, and, and I'm gonna emphasize the word and in this verse. It's what's known as a polysendenton. And the repetitious use of this word and draws emphasis and also points out the strict adherence to the law that the people followed. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house. They had flat roofs on their house at this time. And in their courts and in the courts of the house of God 
and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. They were all over Jerusalem. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Yeshua, uh, the son of Nun, unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. Now, this Yeshua is the same as Joshua of the book of Joshua. Now, this is not to say that they didn't uh, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles by residing in booths at all. What it's saying is that to the extent of the total participation had it not been done since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. Joshua was in the year 1443 B.C., according to Bullinger. Uh, Nehemiah in 426 B.C. Over a thousand years that, that Israel had been residing in booths, Sukkoth, had it not been celebrated to this extent. Also day by day, from the first day until the last day, seven day feast, he, this being Ezra, read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner, according to God's instructions, Leviticus chapter 23. To follow the seven day feast of Feast of Tabernacles was also a holy convocation, a, a Sabbath to close out the, uh, the feasts of the year. As long as a strong leader is present, you're going to hear the word of God from the pulpits, the religious pulpits. But when a weak leader uh, comes in, they will allow Satan to take over God's pulpit. Turn over to Nehemiah chapter 13 with me. As I said earlier, Nehemiah was kind of on loan from our taxerses. And he had a, a period of time that he was allowed to stay in Jerusalem, but then he was committed to go back to our taxerses. And what we find in chapter 13 is Nehemiah is indeed back with our taxerses, and while the cat's away, the mice do play. Chapter 13, verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses through 3 through 6. Now the Ammonites and Moabites were both Adamic peoples. Uh, they were descendants of, of Lot, who was Abraham's uh, uh, nephew. But that was, you know, the Moabite too, by the way, check this word out, is masculine. And therefore, it doesn't apply to Ruth, the Moabitess, who was the great-grandmother of David, the king of Israel. Why were they forbidden to take the Ammonites and Moabites to wife? Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water when they came out of Egypt, but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them, howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam uh, to curse Israel. That's quite a humorous story, I think, in Numbers, where the Balaam's ass starts talking to him. Uh, that, that's, that, that proves that God has a sense of humor, uh, if, if none, none other place in God's word does. But, what happened was Balak hired Balaam, and Balaam wasn't having any success. And Balak said, well, come on, let's, let's move a little closer. Maybe you need to see them better. And then he'd try and curse them again. Of course, that didn't work. And uh, Balak, I'm sure, felt like he didn't get his money worth out because he went home uh, angry and sent Balaam on his way as well. But what did Balaam do that was wrong? Well, number one, he was trying to curse Israel. Uh, number two, he was going against God's will, and he was doing it for money. Verse 3, Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed 
multitude. In other words, they made those who had taken wives of the Moabites and the Ammonites to separate from them. Taking foreign wives was always a snare to Israel. In Ezra chapter 10, even the priests and the rulers were taking foreign wives. Verse 4, And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied with uh, unto Tobiah. Now, Tobiah, in chapters 2, 4, and 6 of this same book, was going against the will of God. He was doing his dead level best along with his sidekick Sanballat to keep the wall from being rebuilt. Jerusalem to be defenseless, in other words. So what we have here is an enemy of Israel. And uh, Tobiah married into a prominent family in Judah, we learn in one other place. But here we got, the, the, and Eliashib, by the way, is not much of a priest because in chapter 10, they had the first members of what was become known as the Sanhedrin who were sealed. Eliashib wasn't sealed. And I think it was because of what he did here, the reason he wasn't sealed. Verse 5, And he, this is Eliashib, had prepared for him, Tobiah, a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers and the porters, and the offerings of the priest. Not anymore. Brought Tobiah, the enemy, right in to where they kept the offerings that were to, what was the purpose of those offerings? To keep the priests and the Levites provided for. What was their responsibility? Bringing the word of God to the people. What we have here is Satan's pulpit being set up. You see, Satan doesn't want God's children to hear God's word. He wants them to listen to his lies and falsehoods. But moving the enemy right into the treasuries of God. Don't let the enemy in your church. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. Nehemiah is away with Artaxerxes. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, actually he was the king of Persia, but they defeated the Babylonians, so this you could rightly say he was the king of Babylon, came I, Nehemiah, unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And Nehemiah is not going to be happy with what he finds on return to Jerusalem. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. Tobiah didn't belong there. And this is like giving Satan the pulpit in your church. And it grieved me sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. He cleaned house. He did the right thing. He threw Tobiah out. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. He set things back in order. I couldn't help but think about Jesus Christ when he went into the temple in Matthew chapter 21, verse 12. And those who bought and sold and the money changers, he cleaned house. He turned their tables over and ran them off. And soon after, he said, my, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. That's exactly what had happened here. They brought a thief in and gave him quarters in the house of God, Tobiah. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them very correctly. They'd been ripped off by Tobiah. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Supposed to be in Jerusalem, doing God's work, ministering in the temple, ministering to the people. And where are they? They had to go home to provide for themselves to find something to eat because Tobiah had ripped everything off in the temple. 
Satan's pulpit does not want God's word taught. And it wasn't being taught while Tobiah was in the house of God. You can really see a type in that. I can for Satan being in God's house. Verse 11. Then contended I with the rulers, those who allowed this to happen, and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. He brought them on the carpet and corrected them, as should have happened. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries, the storehouses of the temple. And I made treasures over the treasuries, Shelmiah, notice the treasurers, plural, that's the way you, all, you always want to do things when God's money is being handled, is the resources. You want to have two at least witnesses, and that's been a long-standing policy of Shepherd's Chapel. Anytime the funds are handled, don't put people in temptation. You have it to where there are more than one involved. The priest and Zadok the scribe and the Levites, Pediah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, and the son of Madaniah, for they were counted faithful, they were trustworthy, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren, to take the tithes and offerings and distribute them equally among the Levites, to make sure that they're able to continue doing the work of God in and around the temple. Nehemiah wasn't a wimp. Um, he cleaned house and he did things right. God's blessings are always sure to follow when you do things God's way. Verse 14, Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, The only thing you can take with you are your works, good, bad, or ugly. In those days saw I in Judah some trading wine presses, uh, some treading wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine grapes and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. While he was away uh, back with our taxerces, this practice started happening. And it happened in the past. In fact, in chapter 10, verse 31, these same people had taken an oath that they would not buy from the, these traders who came to Jerusalem on the Sabbath. There dwelt men of Tyre. Well, your ears should pick up when you hear that. Who, who were the people of Tyre? They were traders. Uh, they were commerce people. Kenites, heavily uh, mixed in. Also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Again, Satan's work. If the people are buying and selling and shopping on the Sabbath, or treading the wine and working, uh, what's, the, what's supposed to be happening on the Sabbath. God's Word is supposed to be taught. So Satan is here making, being successful in keeping God's Word from being taught to the people. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, those who were supposedly in charge, and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? You know, don't you know what caused us to go into captivity to the king of Babylon? Not doing things God's way. What, what did we learn from that? Anything? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil, the captivity into Babylon, upon us and upon this city, Jerusalem destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Verse 19, And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants, uh, trusted servants, set I at the gates that there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day, no works 
or sales of goods. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. They, they came a long ways and brought their goods and wares with them. But when they got there, the gates of Jerusalem were shut. So they set up little tables probably outside of Jerusalem. I would imagine that a lot of them put up half price signs going out of business sale. 21. Then I testified against them, the sellers, and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. And I don't think Nehemiah had the intention of healing anyone by laying his hands on them. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. He got his righteous indignation up and went out and talked to these folks who were coming and causing the people of Jerusalem to err. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates. Usually they would only keep the doors of the temple. But here he see, sees this as being important and he assigns it to the Levites to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. I'm sure when Nehemiah hit the pearly gates that God was standing right there and he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Satan doesn't want God's word taught, but he'll quote God's word. Let's go to Matthew, the New Testament. Matthew chapter 4. Only problem is when Satan quotes scripture, he uh, has a tendency to twist it a little bit. He'll, he'll leave a little here, out here and add a little here. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of course, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And Jesus teaches us all in this scripture how to handle Satan. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. He was physically starving, weak in the flesh, but strong in spirit. And when the tempter came, that's Satan, to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He's kind of saying, I don't believe you are the Son of God. Prove you're the son of God and command that these stones be made bread. Jesus had been without food for 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. What do we learn from this? Satan knows his weakness at that point. Guess what? He knows our weaknesses as well. I pray that none of us has any weaknesses that we can't have power over them. Put your spirit man in charge when your physical man gets hungry and starts demanding, feed me. Satan, my point is Satan's going to hit you at your weakest link as well. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Bread won't give you eternal life, physical bread. The bread of life will, of course. It's the word of God that saves you, not bread. Then the devil, now we know who the tempter was for sure, taketh him up into the holy city, into Jerusalem, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, again, prove you're the Son of God, Cast thyself down. Jump off of this high place. For it is written, here we go, this is Satan speaking. He's quoting scripture. He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. God said you can jump off of this building, and he'll send his angels to catch you. I'll tell you what, you go tempting God in that way and you're going to find that gravity prevails. And you're going to hit the, the ground like that bomb that they 
uh, dropped in Afghanistan and you're going to hit the ground hard. What is this at any time? Psalm 91 verse 11 doesn't say at any time. Satan added that little bit. You know what? Satan left the part out also that says that to keep you in all your ways. He also left out in Psalm 91 verse 13, it states, you will tread on the serpent. Don't tempt God. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 6, 16. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Satan doesn't give up easily. You know, he comes in peacefully and prosperously. We learn in Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. He's going to promise you anything to worship him. And that's what's going on here. Verse 9. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. He stands opposing God, all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, claiming to be God. Worship me. That's what he wants. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13 and 10, verse 20. Of course, today, we, when we order Satan behind us, which you have the power to do, don't forget to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Luke Chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. You know, if a pulpit is left vacant for a period of time, there's no telling who's going to show up and occupy it. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Chapter 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. This was meant for all to hear. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. The pulpit from which God spoke to the people of Israel and us through his servant Moses being occupied by the scribes and Pharisees. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They don't practice what they preach, is what this is saying. This verse is a little confusing. If you have a companion Bible, Bullinger makes a note of explanation. He says, not a command from Jesus to do what they, to observe and do, but this whole chapter is a renunciation of what they say and do. Verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves would not move them with one of their fingers. They tell everyone else, this is what you have to do. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. If you're divorced, you can't remarry. Uh, if you're divorced, you sit at the back of the church. The Word of God does not put burdens or grievous burdens on people. John chapter 8 verse 32, the Word of God sets us free. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Does it say that they, all that they do is to please God? No, it's to please men, to be seen of men. They're on an ego trip. One-upmanship. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Phylacteries were, uh, you see pictures even today of certain religions that have a little leather box on their forehead, tied to their forehead. Uh, 
Uh, that's a phylactery. They also have a box that they hold in their left hand and have about an 18 inch strap that they wrap around their arm up to the elbow. And, and contained in these boxes, you have four sets of scripture, Exodus chapter 13 verses uh, 2 through 10 and 11 through 17, Deuteronomy 6, 4, 9, Deuteronomy 11 verses 13 through 23. But all this is saying is that they're not doing this to be pleasing to God or to serve God. They're doing this as self-service, to, to be seen of others. And love the uppermost rooms at feasts the most honorable places, in other words, and the chief seats in the synagogues. They even took the seat of Moses in the synagogue. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, which is Master, Master. You might hear uh, Reverend might come to mind, or Father. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. In other words, revere the Lord. Don't revere men. Men will let you down every time. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Verse 10, neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Jesus, you know, washed the feet of the disciples. He served all of us by humbling himself to death on the cross. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. That means to be brought low. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. By teaching your own traditions of men, you've made the pulpits where they should be hearing God's word, the Satan's pulpit. These eight woes that we're going to be reading correspond to the eight uh, blessed or be, of the Beatitudes of uh, Matthew chapter 5. If you have a companion Bible, make a note of Appendix 126, and it gives you a comparison. 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites means stage actors. You're, you're playing church, is what Jesus is saying. For ye devour widows' houses. In other words, you take from the needy. And for a pretense, it's an outward show, Make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. You, you travel around the world to make one convert. And when he is made, you make him twofold more a chi the child of hell than yourselves. Not teaching God's word not teaching even salvation to the people, the, the convert that they traveled the world to find. That, that, that one that he found and converted would have been better off if he had left him alone. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, in other words, who will take an oath on the temple, it is nothing. It, it's not binding that you took an oath on the temple. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Now that is binding. Swearing on the temple is not binding. Swearing on the gold, that, that, that makes you committed. What is the temple of the end time? Lord God Almighty and the Lamb thereof. And kind of, I kind of saw in this, they're saying, you know, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb don't make any difference. They're, they're not binding. But the gold, that's binding. Verse 17. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctify the gold. The temple, of course. Uh, Jesus Christ will save you. The gold won't. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. In other words, this is what they teach. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, 
he is guilty. He's a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Of course, the altar. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him, that's the Lord, that dwelleth therein. Verse 22, And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. And I don't recommend that anyone make an oath uh, to God. You know, that is, think about it before you do. Pray about it before you do. Uh, it's, it's not a wise thing to do. I mean, you want to be committed to the Lord, but don't make a habit of swearing this or committing yourself on an oath to the Lord. He's going to hold you to it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you stage actors. You're playing church. For you pay tithe and mint and anise, that's dill, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. You spend time counting every leaf of the offerings, but you're, you're not even committed to the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. The scribes and Pharisees, you see, were religious leaders. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. This means that if you have a gnat in the milk or in the wine, you, you might strain it out. But they're saying you strain a gnat, but then you swallow a whole camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You go through these ritualistic washings of your hands and throw a little water here and a little water there, but on the inside you're full of iniquity, you're full of sin. Those ritualistic washings won't clean the inner man. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within, the inner man, the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Verse 7, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, that's a, a whitewashed wall, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. They lead a lot of people to spiritual death. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. You make your phylacteries broad and your borders long just to be seen of men. You appear to be righteous, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. That's sin. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you stage actors, you're playing church, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. You build up the prophets, and many of you were responsible for their deaths. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. That's said by those who caused the blood of Jesus Christ to be shed on the cross. Oh yes, they would have been there right along with their ancestors. Wherefore ye be witness unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up within the measure of your fathers. You're going to receive exactly what your ancestors received. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Christ is the only way. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, and wise men, and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues, the synagogues of Satan, Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, and persecute them from city to city. Verse 35, That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, 
from the blood of righteous Abel. Who slew Abel? Cain, of course. He's talking to the progeny, the descendants of Cain, the Kenites. Under the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Judgment begins at the pulpit. We're going to do one verse and then we're going to close for this lecture. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. One verse we're going to pick up and it's verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You want to know where judgment begins? It tells you right there. It begins at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Be careful when you hear Satan's pulpit. And you might thought you know, yourself before this lesson, what do you mean Satan's pulpit? I'll tell you what, beloved, turn your television on some Sunday morning and prepare to, if you're familiar with God's word, you're not going to hear much of it on Sunday mornings. They talk about this and they talk about that. They never quite get around to teaching God's word. The pulpits where we're supposed to be hearing the word of God have become Satan's pulpit. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father. By studying your word, Father, we know when someone, Satan, is changing scriptures, Father. We, we know that it is your word that saves, Father, uh, not the, the false uh, doctrines, the uh, lessons that are taught by the traditions of men. And Easter, Father, you know the list goes on and on and on, Father. We do thank you for your word, Father, that word that, that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father. That is what this group that's here before you today, we want to be pleasing to you. And let everything that we do the rest of this day be a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Oregon, I have a long-distance friend that isn't Christian. She isn't religious and doesn't influence me at all. I heard you are not to yoke yourself with one of a different belief. And then you say she's Jewish. Uh, this has troubled me greatly. I will not cast pearls before swine. Only if she asks me questions will I respond. Please let me know if God hates this relationship. So no, I don't believe God uh, hates that relationship that you have uh, as long as you're not allowing this person to influence your relationship uh, with your heavenly father. Naomi from Arizona, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, you can plant a seed and it'll take, you never know. Uh, Naomi from Arizona, my question is, if I like to go to the casino sometimes and I win some money, is it okay to send some of that money to my church of choice? Do you think the Lord would be mad at how I came upon that money. God bless you and the staff. We teach that there is absolutely nothing wrong with using your entertainment money 
if that's what you enjoy doing, to frequent a casino. Many people find uh, companionship, uh, fellowship in casinos. Um, and, but, and again, I'm not saying that you should spend your grocery money at the casino or junior's college fund at the casino, but if you have money left over after you've paid your bills and you uh, have entertainment money, then, then if that's entertaining to you, have at it. And there certainly wouldn't be anything wrong with you uh, tithing on the earnings or winnings that you might have there. And people send in, uh, we had a guy that hit the, uh, oh, what do you call it, the lottery down in Mexico. And he sent a sub substantial uh, amount of, of donation because of his winnings. Uh, of course, we bought television time with it to teach God's Word. So there you go. Dennis in Pennsylvania. Where in the Bible does it say Satan will be turned to ashes from within? Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, start reading about verse 11, and you'll learn there that, uh, that he's called the king of Tyrus there. Don't let that throw you. That's just one of his names. But God promoted Satan to be a cherub that protects the mercy seat. Uh, what happened? Well, he got all puffed up in himself and he wanted to sit on the mercy seat rather than protect it. Uh, it made God very angry. He didn't like the ego that Satan was showing and he, he, he sentenced Satan right then to die into the lake of fire. He'll be turned to ashes from within. I'm out of time. I want you to know that I love you a great deal. Why? because you do enjoy studying the letter that God wrote to you, the Bible. It makes his day when he looks down and he sees you seeking knowledge of him. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, and it's this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.